acting even more repressively at home. Despite Putin's crackdown on free media and his government's continued peddling of blatant lies, we have seen many Russians bravely stand up against Putin's war, including on state-run TV. Now, nearly 15,000 Russians have been detained by Russian authorities for doing just that, for exercising the rights that are as universal to them as the citizens around the world. We support the voices of the people of Russia who are calling for an end to this war, who refuse to let their principled views be silenced, who refuse to let a new Iron Curtain descend again around Russia. Russian journalists are being prosecuted for doing the vital work that you all do here, which is to report, to interview, and to share the truth about what is happening. The people of Russia have a right to know about the thousands and thousands of casualties that the Russian Federation's forces are taking right now in Ukraine, as well as the civilian casualties and the widespread destruction of civilian infrastructure Putin is inflicting on the people of Ukraine. There are thousands of Russian mothers who will never see their sons again, yet the media in Russia is not allowed to share that information with the people of Russia, obscuring the real costs of this war. Those who dare to speak up are branded as liars, they're branded as traitors, and they are subject to prosecution. We stand with Russian citizens of conscience as they seek to exercise their rights to freedom of expression and peaceful assembly. We will hold responsible those who engage in human rights abuses. We will ensure that credible allegations of war crimes are investigated and those involved are held responsible. To that end, as you saw earlier today, the Secretary announced a series of actions in, res in response to President Putin's premeditated, unjustified, and unprovoked war against Ukraine and its people, as well as the Lukashenko regime's efforts to enable Russia's further invasion. This war does not reflect the will of the peoples of Russia and Belarus. Indeed, their respective governments' aggressive behavior abroad is coupled with systemic and increasing repression within their own borders. We are witnessing an autocratic attack on democracy. U.S. actions today include sanctions and visa restrictions on Russian, uh, Russian and Belarusian officials and private individuals involved in human rights abuses, corruption, and repression. The United States and our partners and allies, we are committed to imposing massive, severe costs on those involved in the invasion of Ukraine. As Russian soldiers continue to die needlessly in Ukraine and the economic consequences of the war mount within Russia, the world remains open to genuine diplomacy. We will, together with our Ukrainian partners and our allies and partners around the world, continue to pursue every avenue to de-escalate the conflict in the bloodshed and save lives. Next, today we acknowledge the anniversary of the Syrian uprising. On this day, 11 years ago, the Syrian people took to the streets in the name of freedom, reform, and human rights. Bashar al-Assad responded to this peaceful call with brutality sparking a war against his own people that has killed hundreds of thousands, displaced more than 13 million, brought food and security to some 12 million, and left 14.6 million people in need of humanitarian assistance. As we stand with the Syrian people, we continue our efforts to explore, <clears throat> to secure a nationwide ceasefire, expand access to humanitarian aid, achieve justice and accountability for the Syrian people, and reach a political resolution, as outlined by UN Security Council Resolution 2254. We will not normalize relations with Assad until and unless there is irreversible progress towards that political solution. The Syrian people deserve nothing less after more than a decade of war. Before I turn to your questions, I just had one, want to add uh, one final element. I know all of us in this room were heartbroken uh, yesterday to learn that uh, our colleague, Ben Hall, uh, sustained injuries uh, while reporting from Ukraine. Uh, and today I understand that Fox News has announced uh, that his camera operator, Pierre Zekrzewski, uh, lost his life in the same attack. All of us know Ben. Uh, we've traveled the world with him. Uh, many of you uh, knew Pierre, who was renowned for uh, his talent documenting conflict zones around the world. Uh, our thoughts are with Pierre's loved ones, uh, his family, uh, and all of us here at the department are rooting for Ben and rooting for his speedy recovery. Ben's collegial collegiality, his sense of humor, his wit, his warmth uh, have always been a balm for the very tough questions uh, that he would always uh, hurl my way at the way of uh, Secretary Blinken. I know I speak for the Secretary 
when I say that we look forward once again, hopefully very soon, uh, to being on the receiving end of all of those. Uh, we have engaged at uh, multiple levels uh, with Fox News. We have made very clear uh, that we will do everything we possibly can uh, to help Ben and any others uh, who, may have, who may have been involved uh, and injured uh, in this horrific attack. Uh, so with that, I'll take your questions. Thanks, Ben. Um, I don't see Rich or Nick in here, so I'll say um, I don't want to speak for Fox, but thank you for those comments and on behalf of the whole press board, thank you for that. We appreciate it. Um, before going into um, to, to Ukraine, uh, I just wanted to ask one thing that you just said about the anniversary of the Syria situation uh, struck me as a bit unusual. You said we will not normalize relations with Assad until and unless, and then you gave the conditions. Mm -hmm. uh, when did it become a possibility that the U.S. would ever normalize relations with Assad? Yeah. Well, For a long time, the line was his days are numbered. I mean, going back <clears throat> almost 11 years now. It, it has been 11 years, Matt. It has been 11 years well, since a peaceful uprising was met with the iron fist of the Assad like regime. It. So when, 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 so has there been a decision made that that, um, that you could, in fact, go back to having normal relations with, uh, with a government in Syria that is led by Bashar Assad? Matt, there can never be normal relations with a government that has treated its own population, its own people, uh, with the level of brutality, with the level of violence, with the level of suppression, the use of chemical weapons, other forms of horrific violence that we've seen from this regime. Uh, we've made our position clear uh, when it comes to holding uh, the Assad regime accountable. We have not, we will not lift sanctions on Bashar al-Assad or his regime. We will continue to oppose reconstruction led by uh, or for the Assad regime uh, until and unless there is irreversible progress on uh, that political solution that is laid out in UN Security Council Resolution 2254. Uh, well, you're, but you're saying it is possible to, for the U.S. to have a normal relationship with, an, with a government led by Assad, Matt, if I, those conditions are met? Matt, I do not think there will ever be a normal relationship. Well, you said uh, you were with, the one who used the word normalize, so I just... There, I, I think the, that that term has come up in the context of, of other governments uh, that have uh, uh, approach the Assad regime. We've made very clear uh, that the United States government will maintain our sanctions on the regime. We continue to support uh, the political process as laid out in the UN Security Council resolution, resolution 2254. We continue to stand with the people of Syria in that regard. On Ukraine, I just have two uh, brief ones uh, that are kind of diplomatically related. Um, both of them have to do with Russia. You uh, mentioned the sanctions that you uh, guys imposed today on them, but they also imposed um, sanctions on uh, several you know, the President, the Secretary, uh, Secretary of Defense, others. I noticed you were left off I, the I'm list. Feeling, I'm feeling left out. <laughs> um, but I'm just wondering, you know, the White House, uh, obviously your colleague at the White House addressed this earlier and said, well, you know, uh, we're, none of us have bank accounts in Russia. None of us are planning to go to, you know, Sochi for vacation or anything like that. But, you know, that's exactly what the Russians say about the sanctions that you put on them. Uh, that they essentially had no impact, and they're just so. I'm just wondering, uh, you know, what you what you have to say about the sanctions that they imposed. And then the second one, which I'm sure you're responsible, will be extremely brief. Is it, do you have any uh, comment about Russia formally withdrawing from the Council of Europe? Uh, so first on the sanctions, um, look, I don't have a, a specific response uh, to it. I will let my uh, esteemed colleague, who is now the subject of Russian sanctions. Uh, I will let her response uh, stand. But let me make a, a couple general points. Uh, number one, you asked uh, how our sanctions are any different from their sanctions. Well, I'm, I know how they're different, but, I, but you know, when you blow off their sanctions and say, well, none of us have bank accounts there, none of us were, well, that's exactly the same thing as the, the Russians say. Are well, you, like, so, so I'll make a couple points there. Uh, number one, uh, anyone who claims that the measures we have imposed uh, whether on individuals uh, or the Russian economy or the Russian financial system. Anyone who claims that those measures have been inconsequential uh, has not been in Russia, uh, has not been observing what has happened to the Russian economy and to the Russian financial system. Uh, this is an economy that is in a tailspin. It is an economy that is reeling. It is an economy that is uh, suffering um, uh, the worst uh, setback, the worst couple weeks uh, that, the, that it has had since the demise of the Soviet Union. 
Uh, 30 years of economic integration have been undone uh, over the span of some uh, two weeks. And you can look at any measure. Uh, the Russian stock market, which has now been closed for weeks, will be closed uh, at least through the course of this week, presumably to prevent capital flight. Uh, the fact that the ruble is almost virtually worthless, literally worth less uh, than a penny. The fact that a hun hundreds uh, of international companies are fleeing, uh, heading for the doors, wanting no part uh, and no role in supporting Putin's uh, war effort. The fact that uh, inflation is skyrocketing. Rocketing. The fact that Russia's uh, uh, credit rating is now uh, essentially at junk status. I could go on and on and on. Uh, that those are uh, the sanctions and economic measures that are targeting uh, the Russian system broadly. Uh, you look at those measures that are targeting uh, Russian individuals, oligarchs, cronies, President Putin, Foreign Minister Lavrov, Sergei Shoigu, uh, Dmitry Peskov, uh, others. We've already had cases of asset seizures, asset forf forfeitures. There will be more of that. Uh, the Department of Treasury, the Department of Justice, they are working closely uh, with their counterparts uh, around the world to go after yachts, to go after aircraft, aircraft to go after uh, ill-begotten gains that have been plundered uh, by and pilfered uh, from the Russian people. Uh, that will continue. Let me make one other point. I saw that the Russians called this, uh, in a sense, a reciprocal measure. Uh, I, I think uh, I certainly uh, took umbrage uh, at that term, uh, noting that uh, nothing can be reciprocal, uh, given that we imposed uh, the measures we did in response to President Putin starting a premeditated, unprovoked, unjustified uh, war against a civilian population uh, next door. Uh, we imposed our measures uh, in response to the untold death and destruction, uh, the killing of civilians uh, in Ukraine, the loss of life that both sides uh, have uh, already uh, endured. We imposed our measures for the destruction and attempt of, uh, at destruction of an entire uh, country. And we imposed our measures in response to President Putin's uh, apparent thought that he could flout uh, the basic tenets of the rules-based international order, uh, the rules that all countries uh, have abided by, uh, the rules that have really set the predicate for some 70 plus years of untold levels of stability, security, uh, prosperity around the world, whether that's in Europe, whether that's in the Indo-Pacific, uh, whether that is in anywhere, uh, anywhere in between. Uh, so there's nothing reciprocal uh, about what the Russians have done versus what we together uh, with our allies and partners have sought to do. What the Russian Federation has done is start a war, has caused untold uh, loss of life in Ukraine, among Ukrainians, among Ukrainian civilians, men, women, children, maternity hospitals, residential buildings, not to mention uh, the Russians who have also uh, lost their lives in uh, this needless war. Uh, President Putin has started a war. Uh, we are doing everything we can with our measures, with our other steps, to end the war. Council, Council of Europe. Oh, Council, you, Council of Europe. Does that register with you, or does it, you think it doesn't matter? I mean, I know you're not part of the Council of Europe. Well, we, we are aware uh, that Russia has informed the Council of Euro Europe that it intends to uh, withdraw. Of course, we would refer you to the Council for uh, next steps. Uh, we did previously welcome the Council of Europe's suspension of the Russian Federation for its aggression in Ukraine. Uh, we similarly welcomed uh, the Parliamentary Assembly's strong statements of support. Uh, for Ukraine in the uh, extraordinary session that was held. Uh, and we share the Council of Europe's values, uh, human rights, democracy, the rule of law. Russia clearly does not share these same values. I think it is only appropriate uh, that Russia is not a member so of such a council. concerned that this shuts down yet another potential channel of communication? We have uh, uh, plenty of uh, potential channels for communication. What we need to see from the Rus Russian Federation is the Russian Federation engage in good faith uh, with seriousness, seriousness of purpose through those channels. Mayor. Just to follow up a little bit on the action, EU today, for example, took action to freeze the assets of Abramovich. Um, as far as I know, the US has not done anything on that, um, on that particular individual. Are you guys planning to? Because there was a time where you said from this podium that you were, that US was looking to catch up with EU and make some of the measures symmetrical. 
And I also would love um, your response on what does the U.S. make of Abramovich's like recent moves? He was in Israel, Turkey, Russia. Um, does the U.S. see him as a potential interlocutor? He's not just a private citizen. Uh, so a couple points, Yumaira. First, uh, and most importantly in response to your question, we don't preview uh, any actions that we may or may not take. Uh, what I will say, and you referenced this, is that uh, the European Union, they have their own authorities, they have their own capabilities, we have our own authorities, we have our own capabilities. What we have done each over time uh, is to harmonize uh, the steps we have taken uh, in important regards. Uh, so there have been uh, times where we have take act, taken action against entities, against individuals, uh, that the Europeans, other countries and partners around the world uh, in turn followed suit. Uh, there have been times where the European Union has, uh, in the first instance, taken such action, uh, and we have later harmonized uh, our authorities uh, going after uh, similar targets. Uh, I certainly have no doubt that we will continue, the EU will continue, our partners and allies around the world will continue to go after oligarchs, to go after cronies, to go after all of those uh, who are in one way or another aiding and abetting uh, Putin's war effort and uh, playing a role in his uh, war machine. Uh, just look at what we did today, one day alone. Uh, we announced actions against 91 individuals in one entity. Uh, we used five different authorities across two departments, the Department of State uh, and the Department of uh, the Treasury. I won't go through the whole roster, uh, but there were visa restrictions under uh, Section 7031C of the Department of State Foreign Operations and Related Programs Appropriation Act of last year. Uh, there were uh, designations pursuant to an executive order, 14024. Uh, there, was, uh, there were visa restrictions announced under Section 212A3C of the Immigration and Nationality Act. Uh, this is a new authority that allows us to uh, go after current and former government, Russian government officials believed to be involved in suppressing dissent uh, in Russia and around the world. Uh, there were uh, 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 imposition of visa restrictions on six individuals under the Khashoggi ban. Of course, this was a new authority that we announced uh, early in the administration uh, last year uh, in response to governments around the world pursuing dissidents extra uh, territorially. And we also used Presidential Proclamation 8015. Uh, to go after 25 individuals responsible for undermining democracy uh, in Belarus. We will continue to go after those responsible for the war effort in Ukraine. We will continue to go after those responsible for uh, aiding the war effort, those who reside in Belarus. We will continue to go after private individuals uh, whose uh, closeness to uh, the Russian government, to the Kremlin, uh, whose ill-begotten wealth, uh, is a result of um, illicit activity, uh, plundering what should belong to uh, the Russian people. Uh, we will continue to do that, but what we won't do is preview uh, those actions. Sure. How about the second part? Do you see that some of these people can actually be interlocutors as well? And with this particular individual, because you have a task force, are you also keeping an eye on their movement? So I'm not going to speak to any particular individual. What I will uh, reiterate is what I told Matt. Uh, there are plenty of fora, there are plenty of avenues for diplomacy. Uh, we know that our French partners, our German partners, our Israeli partners, our Turkish partners, our Ukrainian partners, of course, uh, have engaged in diplomacy, uh, direct diplomacy with the Russian Federation. What we're not looking for, what we're not bereft of, are avenues. What we're not missing are, are not fora. What we're looking for is a genuine display of good faith on the part of the Russian Federation. Uh, we need them to show up uh, at any one of uh, these venues uh, to make clear that they are genuinely interested uh, in de-escalation, in putting an end to this conflict, in putting an end to this war, and putting an end to the senseless and needless loss of life. And you have received no such indication up until this moment? I, I think we will, any channel. We, we will judge that based upon what we see in Ukraine. And what we have seen in Ukraine, including in recent days, including in recent hours, is continued escalation, is continued bombardment of towns, of cities, of residential areas, is continued loss of life. Paul. Okay, so I understand all you said about the Russian economy, but the average Russian doesn't own stocks. The average Russian doesn't buy a lot of imported goods. Uh, the Russian ruble has lost, um, if I'm right, 35, 40 percent of its value, which is not as bad as some of the economic crises we've seen in, in a long time. Um, and you haven't gotten 
any progress on, on deconfliction, de-escalation. So what about taking more steps? What about expanding SWIFT things? We continue to s send money to Russia for energy purchases. So uh, why aren't you taking stronger steps to add sanctions on a lot of people who don't have Western bank accounts or, or property in the United States? doesn't seem to add much pressure. So in terms of energy purchases, the president did, inside, did sign an executive order last week putting an end to our purchase of Russian oil, our purchase of Russian energy. I mean, West, the, the, the Western thing. Well, uh, the, the point is, Paul, that uh, we have already applied a set of measures that have been unprecedented uh, in terms of their scale, in terms of their scope, and in terms of their impacts. And I won't go through uh, the various metrics of impact uh, again, but they're clear for everyone to see. Uh, the other point is that as long as President Putin continues to escalate, we, working with our allies and partners, will continue to escalate. You mentioned you, you, you mentioned some measures that, that may be on the table. Uh, going back to what I offered to Humaira, of course, we're not in a position to preview specifically uh, what we are prepared to do. But what I can tell you uh, that we are prepared to do is continue to escalate uh, the costs. And I should say that the economic sanctions, the other uh, financial uh, measures and economic measures that uh, we have placed on the Russian Federation, that is uh, one important uh, measure to mount pressure on uh, the Kremlin, on President Putin, on those around him. Uh, it is uh, clearly uh, putting the squeeze on their economy, on their financial system. Uh, at the same time, uh, we will continue simultaneously to provide our Ukrainian partners uh, with massive amounts of security assistance. In recent weeks alone, we've spoken of some $550 million worth of security assistance. Those deliveries uh, are continuing uh, just about every day. Anti-armor, anti-tank, anti-aircraft, small arms, munitions, uh, precisely what our colleagues at the Department of Defense uh, have determined that our Ukrainian partners most need uh, to defend their country against this invasion. Uh, and we are very fortunate uh, that given the uh, passage of uh, the spending legislation out of Congress, uh, we now have $13.6 billion uh, for the people of Ukraine in different realms. Uh, and a good chunk of that money, about half of it, uh, will uh, be um, uh, made available in the form of additional security assistance. Uh, so we have provided more than $1.2 billion in security assistance to our Ukrainian partners over the course of the past year. We're going to be in a position to do much, much more, uh, given the uh, spending uh, allocation that we recently have had uh, from Congress. That is another avenue uh, that is putting pressure uh, on President Putin. And we have seen uh, that pressure and the effectiveness of that security assess, uh, assistance, the effectiveness uh, of the Ukrainian resistance, in that we are now on day 20 uh, of this Russian invasion, of this Russian war. Uh, President Putin certainly uh, cannot be comfortable uh, with what he has seen uh, from his forces on the battlefield. I will leave it to, to others to offer the, the military analysis. But again, President Putin gravely miscalculated if he thought that he could dispatch 100,000 forces into a sovereign country and not face and find the stiff resistance that he's found with thousands of Russians, Russian service members, losing their lives, uh, with his forces stalled in key areas. President Putin has gravely miscalculated if he thought he could do all of this without facing opposition at home. And we've seen very prominent displays of that opposition, including in recent hours, in ways that would have been unexpected even a few weeks ago. Uh, 15,000 people arrested across Russia, across dozens of Russian cities, including in President Putin's hometown of St. Petersburg, uh, for peacefully exercising the rights that are as universally available to them as to anyone else uh, on the planet, the right to freedom of assembly, the right to... Uh, 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 freedom of expression. We continue to stand with them. And President Putin, going back to where we started, has gravely miscalculated if he thought that the United States, that our allies and partners were bluffing when we talked about the profound costs that we were prepared to impose on Russia's economy, on its financial system, uh, on the Kremlin, if he were to go forward. President Putin has now found uh, that he... Uh, um, uh, made grave miscalculations in all in all three regards. John, uh, follow up, sure.
Oh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Paul asked about the more stronger steps, and you told about the military support to Ukraine. But uh, one of those more stronger steps might be the transferring to Ukraine the old uh, Soviet era weapons. And so, could you, including S300, so could you comment on the CNN today's report that reportedly State Department is already involved in the talks with the European partners and uh, creating such a list? So we are in constant discussion with our Ukrainian partners in the first instance about their uh, their needs, their security needs. I can say that Secretary Blinken spoke to Foreign Minister Kuleba uh, again today. Uh, they discussed uh, Ukraine's uh, security needs once again. Uh, working very closely with our colleagues at the Department of Defense, uh, we have put together uh, packages uh, of defensive security assistment, uh, uh, assistance that our Ukrainian partners most need. Uh, and as I said before, that includes anti-armor, that includes tanks, uh, anti-tank, that includes small arms, that includes uh, munition, munitions, and it, and it most certainly includes uh, anti-aircraft and surface-to-air systems. Uh, so we are not detailing every element of those security packages that we are providing, uh, but we are continuing to provide uh, security assistance in all of those realms. We know uh, that Russian missiles, Russian rockets, Russian artillery uh, have wrought destruction across large parts of Ukraine, uh, and we are prepared to and we have uh, provided our Ukrainian partners with the sort of surface-to-air systems, anti-aircraft systems uh, that would help protect themselves uh, against uh, this, this onslaught, against these uh, attacks. We are always looking at what's in our inventories and also our allies around the world are looking at what's in their inventories. And Secretary Blinken uh, has on several occasions now authorized our NATO allies to provide U.S. origin equipment to our Ukrainian partners. Uh, our inclination has always been to, respond, to be uh, responsive uh, to precisely what our Ukrainian partners need. Uh, we've been able to do that with the funding we've been granted uh, from Congress. And now that we have $13.6 billion of additional funding to work with, uh, about half of which uh, will uh, go in the direction of security assistance, we'll be able to do quite a bit more. Anti-tank. 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 Anti-armor. John. Uh, because things are always moving in the air. Um, since the start of Russia's invasion, has the United States yet engaged directly with Russia about uh, off-ramps or ways to reduce violence? Directly? Have you, have you engaged directly with Russia about this? Uh, John, a number of our partners are engaged uh, directly uh, with the Russian Federation at high levels. Uh, I think what is clear is that none of these engagements have yet resulted in the diminution of violence uh, in an end uh, to the war, uh, in a reduction uh, of the loss of life uh, that we've seen across Ukraine. If we determine uh, that high-level U.S. engagement uh, would be uh, advantageous to help move forward uh, with that overriding goal of putting an end to this violence, putting an end to this senseless war, we would absolutely be prepared to do so. What we have found, however, what our partners and allies have found, however, and what our Ukrainian partners, most importantly, have found, however, is that uh, we have yet to find a Russian interlocutor that is either able or willing uh, to negotiate in good faith, and certainly not in the context of de-escalation given that Russian forces have continued to escalate, have continued to uh, um, wreak violence uh, across Ukraine. Uh, so we'll continue to look for diplomatic openings. In the meantime, we will continue to support uh, our Ukrainian partners, as well as the diplomatic efforts that uh, our allies around the and, world are and, taking part in. And then uh, can you just comment on the statements from Moscow about receiving written assurances related to the Iran deal? Uh, so... We've discussed this uh, yesterday a bit. Um, what I will say uh, is that uh, we have made significant progress uh, over uh, recent days uh, when it comes to the possibility of uh, mutual return to compliance uh, with the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. Uh, we continue to, get, to engage with Russia on a return to full implementation of the JCPOA. Uh, I think uh, what you heard from Foreign Minister Lavrov, I will let him speak for himself, I will let the Russians speak for themselves, but uh, is, it may well be a reflection of the fact that we, of course, uh, would not sanction Russian participation in nuclear projects that are part of resuming full impl implementation 
of the JCPOA. Uh, we can't and we won't and we have not uh, provided assurances beyond that to Russia. Uh, we will let uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov uh, speak to uh, uh, speak for his country. Uh, but perhaps it is now clear uh, to Moscow, perhaps a couple things are now clear. Uh, number one, uh, as we have said publicly, uh, the new Russia-related sanctions are unrelated to a potential return to uh, full compliance with the JCPOA, and they shouldn't have any, impa any, any impact on its implementation. And it may well uh, be a reflection of what we've said all along, uh, that an Iran that is unconstrained in its nuclear program uh, and that has no permanence, verifiable limits attached to that nuclear program. That is not in our interests. It is not in the interests of our European allies. It is not in the interests uh, of the PRC. And it's certainly not in the interests uh, of the Russian Federation. Uh, I will reiterate one additional point that uh, you've heard several references in recent days to external factors. Uh, and we have engaged uh, with the Russian Federation on uh, the possibility of a mutual return to compliance with the JCPOA, but as I said the other day, there uh, were and are a small number of outstanding issues. Uh, now that we are uh, this close to uh, the finish line, those outstanding issues tend to be uh, the hardest issues, uh, so we're not there yet. Nothing is agreed until everything is agreed, uh, but we continue to assess uh, that mutual return to compliance uh, would be the most effective, uh, the best way uh, to verifiably and permanently uh, once again, have those limits on Iran's nuclear pro program. Laura. So to follow up, is it do you still an understanding that the objections that Russia raised in the last few days have now been resolved? It is what I'm what I'm relaying to you is that you will need to ask the Russians. Uh, that you guys are in the negotiations with them. So is it this building's understanding that they are no longer objecting? We have seen the statements from Foreign Minister Lavrov. Uh, we will leave it to the Russian Federation, to Foreign Minister Lavrov, to others to explain exactly uh, what those statements uh, mean. Uh, but it is logical. Uh, it has been logical to us. It should be logical uh, to all parties uh, that we would not sanction Russian participation in nuclear projects uh, that are part of a full resumption of uh, the JCPOA if, in fact, uh, we are able to get there. We have not offered the Russians anything more uh, there has been uh, nothing additional uh, conveyed, um, but you'll have to refer to, uh, you'll have to ask the foreign minister. Well, let me ask it this way. Did you guys understand whatever it was that Lavrov was trying to say? Like, what was your understanding of what he was saying? I'm, I'm not going to interpret uh, the foreign minister's remarks. Uh, again, uh, you'll need to talk to them uh, to ask their position, where they are on a potential mutual return to compliance. We know where the Russian Federation has been in the past, of course, Russia was an original member of the P5 plus 1, understanding since well before 2015 that uh, a nuclear-armed Iran uh, or an Iran on the verge uh, of a nuclear weapon would not be in Moscow's interest, certainly not uh, in our interests. Uh, we hope to uh, be able to uh, complete a mutual return to compliance with the JCPOA in short order. We should be able to uh, if uh, negotiators, if the parties uh, – come together, negotiate uh, in good faith, uh, and close out these remaining outstanding issues. Russian activity uh, related to the, uh, any return to the deal. The, the Ukraine-related sanctions well post-date the original JCPOA. I mean, they only date back to February, mm -hmm. late February of this year. If there is a Russian, and I realize this is a hypothetical, but you seem to be raising the hypothetical and the answer to your question, and maybe you're not the right person to ask because it gets into the weeds here. But if there is something that is allowed, an activity that is allowed under the JCPOA, but it involves transactions that are sanctioned by not just the United States, but also the EU, under the, uh, you know, with a bank, with a financial institution, a Russian financial institution. How can you say that that's exempt? Well, uh, to be clear, uh, Russia is not getting out of the sanctions and other uh, financial measures that we have so been, they that, that we have been, so that, 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 that have been imposed uh, for uh, this war in Ukraine. What we are talking about here uh, is uh, the very basic point, something that should be 
uh, quite clear that we would not sanction Russian participation in nuclear projects that are part of, re of a full resumption of the JCPOA. Uh, these are separate realms. These are separate areas. Uh, if they involve any kind of a money mo monetary transaction that touches either the European or American financial systems, or SWIFT for that matter, then you have a problem. I don't see how you can uh, how you can exempt them. Because if I'm the Russians and I see that that's exempted, well, then all, all of a sudden, every foreign transaction that I do is going to be related to Iran's nuclear program, and and therefore <laughs> exempt under. So, so Matt, I, I think two I think I think two things can be true. One, the JCPOA is not going to be an escape hatch uh, for the Russian Federation and the uh, sanctions uh, that have been imposed on it because of the war in Ukraine. Uh, but two, uh, we are not going to sanction Russia for undertaking, for participating uh, in uh, nuclear projects that are part of uh, the JCPOA. You're right. You're asking a very weedy question. It's probably better for... Okay. Uh, then let me add another one to it, maybe better for an expert. But, but you know, then what about the idea of some, the secondary sanctions? Because, you know, any, any, any bank or financial institution that would, uh, that would be involved in a transaction, say Russia purchases heavy water from the Iranians or, 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 or enriched uranium, uh, you're, 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 uh, this seems to open the, the Pandora's box that you keep talking about and other things. It just seems that... The Russians will be able to disguise any number of non-Iranian nuclear deal transactions through that same channel of exemptions that you're offering. Well, so so what you're raising is a hypothetical wrapped in another hypothetical. The hypothetical that uh, I'm sorry, but you're talking about a deal that doesn't exist yet. Well, that, 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 that's my so point. No, that's, well, my hypotheticals that's, that's are related that's are based on your. Initial hypothetical. That's that's exactly my point. So rather than get wrapped around the axle of hypotheticals, well, we'll can we get someone down here to go through this uh, we'll, stuff. Uh, we'll, uh, any more Ukraine questions? <laughs> seems, <laughs> seems like there are a couple of Ukraine questions. Is Robert Mali going back to Vienna this week? Uh, Rob Malley and his team, they are, uh, they are still based here. I understand that negotiators are, uh, are still in capitals. Uh, if it is prudent, if it is uh, appropriate uh, for Rob and the team to go back to Vienna, uh, they're prepared to do so. And on, on Ukraine, uh, how did the secretary receive the news uh, of sanctioning him and uh, the president and other U.S. officials by uh, Russia? Uh, you know, I, I haven't discussed, him, uh, discussed it with him uh, yet today, but uh, based on previous discussions, I, I don't think he'll uh, be surprised. He, he will be able to see it. Uh, I'm sorry. He will be able to go to bed. Uh, I, I think I think he will sleep just as soundly as he otherwise would, which, uh, given that he is Secretary of State, uh, probably isn't all that soundly. And on Saudi Arabia, uh, Ned, uh, uh, Saudi Arabia considers accepting uh, the Chinese uh, currency instead of dollars for Chinese oil sales. Uh, what's your reaction to that? Uh, we don't have a specific uh, reaction to that. Uh, what I would say is that. Um, we've said time and again uh, that uh, our relationship uh, with the PRC um, is at its heart competitive. Uh, it will be collaborative when it can be, adversarial uh, when it must be. Our allies and partners around the world are going to have their own relationships uh, with the PRC. What we are not asking countries to do is to choose uh, between the United States and China. Uh, when it comes to uh, many of our uh, partners, what we seek to do is to give them choices uh, and to make partnership with the United States and all that we bring to the table, all that we could bring uh, to a bilateral relationship, um, uh, make sure that uh, countries, partners around the world uh, know just how appealing that is. And one on uh, UAE two, how do you view the UAE conflicting uh, statements on increasing the oil production? Uh, the ambassador in Washington uh, said that they will increase uh, the production and their energy minister contradicted them. I, I will leave it to our Emirati uh, partners to speak to, uh, to speak to this question. We, of course, are not a member of OPEC. We're not a member of OPEC+. Plus, uh, but as you know, uh, we have engaged with companies, uh, with countries around the world. Uh, we maintain an interest uh, in a steady global energy supply, uh, and our uh, diplomatic outreach is a, is, a, is a large element of that. Laura. So we've talked in the past about uh, the possibility of expediting refugee, returning refugees to the United States. I'm wondering if there's any update to that, if the position in this building is still that they must apply through UNHCR, which is a process that you know can take months, 
Um, over the weekend, we saw some people trying to come into the United States from the southern border. Is there any consideration given to um, humanitarian, temporary humanitarian parole for Ukrainians who might want to come to the United States, especially if they already have ties, family members in the United States? And then uh, I have a second question for you on a unrelated Ukraine topic. So a couple points. We uh, discussed this a bit yesterday, but uh, there are now nearly 3 million uh, Ukrainians who have been forced to leave their homes uh, because of uh, this violence. Uh, we are deeply, deeply grateful uh, to Ukraine's neighbors, to countries throughout Europe who have so generously uh, opened uh, their arms to welcome uh, these Ukrainian refugees. We recognize the fact uh, that many Ukrainians have family, have loved ones who are in Europe. Uh, we expect most Ukrainian refugees will seek uh, to remain in Europe until and unless they can uh, return to their homes. And of course, that is our, uh, that is our ultimate objective, uh, to see to it that Ukrainians who have been displaced by this violence, whether they're uh, one of the two million internally displaced persons inside of Ukraine, or nearly one of the three million, one of the three mil million, nearly, one of nearly three million uh, Ukrainian refugees who have been forced uh, to flee their country. Our goal, of course, is to see to it that they can uh, return to their homes once uh, this violence ends. We are working with UNHCR, with resettlement partners, overseas posts, uh, to determine whether uh, Ukrainians who have departed Ukraine require resettlement to a third country because they can't be protected in their current location. Uh, we, as we always do, assess protection needs, and that includes uh, cases of particular vulnerability as a central tenet of our uh, refugee admissions uh, to address the urgent need for resettlement across all regions. Uh, we don't discriminate uh, on the basis of any country of origin. As we discussed yesterday, our refugee ceiling has uh, various regional categories attached to it. There's a category for those uh, who would uh, emanate from Ukraine. Uh, any admissions of uh, Ukrainian nationals through the U.S. Refugee Admissions Program uh, would be in accordance with that presidential, determin presidential determination on refugee uh, admissions. Uh, what I can say right now is that uh, we have been, we will continue to be a country that welcomes refugees uh, from around the world. Um, we know that uh, as a nation of immigrants, as uh, a nation that has always opened its arms to refugees, we are made stronger, uh, that it is very much in our American DNA to continue doing uh, just that. If there is a need to resettle Ukrainian refugees in the United States, uh, we will look uh, to do so. I, have, uh, I am fully confident uh, we will do so. If there are additional authorities or avenues uh, that need to be investigated, I have every uh, I have full confidence we'll do that too. But is, this, is the administration considering an expedited process for any people at this point? Do you know? Uh, so again, I, don't, I wouldn't want to get ahead of anything, but we do have uh, processes that are in place, including through uh, the U.S. refugee admissions uh, uh, process. Uh, where we have the ability to bring in Ukrainian refugees should the need arise. Okay, and I also wanted to ask about the case of Brittany Griner. It's been almost a month since she's been detained in Russia. Um, what, what is the State Department's understanding of how her conditions are in Russia right now as she's being held, and what is the State Department doing to try to get her released? There's not much I can say, given the privacy considerations that are uh, implicated in this case. Uh, this is a case that we have been working on uh, since the time of her detention. Every time an American is detained overseas, uh, our consular officers, including our consular officers uh, in Moscow, are uh, providing every uh, form of support that we can. Uh, in this case, I'm just not able to go into the into the details, uh, but we are doing everything we can to uh, support Brittany Griner, to support uh, her family, uh, and to work uh, with them, do everything we can uh, to uh, see that she is uh, treated appropriately uh, and to, to seek her release. That's correct. You have not had consular access to her. I'm just, I, I could not speak to that at this point, given the privacy concerns. Well, well, hold on a second. It, 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 I, <laughs> This is a 30-year, almost 30-year battle that I have had. How is she exactly supposed to sign a Privacy Act waiver if you guys can't get to her? Uh, to ask her to see if she wants to sign one. Uh, so Matt, I get that. So Matt, I, wait, I, get, wait, I, wait, I understand you can't give details. Well, Matt, there's a, there's, there's a factual answer to your question, if you'll listen for a okay. moment. Uh, lawyers 
uh, do uh, oftentimes, including in the case of Russia, Russian lawyers uh, do have access to clients without speaking to any particular case, including this case. Russian lawyers have access to clients in Russia, uh, and uh, as appropriate, they can pass uh, Privacy Act waivers. Yes. Detention. So, I mean, yes. clearly, I mean, there there is a way you could go. I mean, you, a couple of weeks ago, or actually last week, you wouldn't even you weren't even able and, to. And, 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 and what I can say is that I expect we'll be able to say more uh, in in the coming days. Do you have any sense? Can you give us any sense of her condition? Is she being treated well? Uh, again, I'm just not in a position to to offer uh, updates right now. Yes, Connor. Mm -hmm. Have U.S. officials been briefed on how those talks went? And, and in particular, Ukrainian officials expressed some optimism afterwards. Do you share that optimism? Everything you said earlier would indicate that you don't. Well, the Ukraine, our Ukrainian partners are the ones who are uh, taking part in these conversations. Uh, the conversations over the past couple of days have been virtual. Uh, but as I mentioned a moment ago, Secretary Blinken did have an opportunity earlier today to speak to Foreign Minister Kuleba. Uh, every time he has spoken to, virtually every time he's spoken to Foreign Minister Kuleba, the Foreign Minister has passed on updates uh, regarding uh, the diplomatic efforts. Uh, rather than characterize uh, whether we're optimistic or pessimistic, uh, again, what we are going to be looking for are developments on the ground. Uh, and the developments we want to see are clear. We want to see de-escalation. We want to see a diminution of the violence. Uh, we ultimately want to see a withdrawal uh, of Russian forces uh, from inside Ukraine. We have not seen any of those things just yet. Uh, President Zelensky today said that Ukrainians should be prepared um, that the country would not be allowed into NATO. Um, have you advised his administration at all in these talks whether or not that should be something that they commit to, to not uh, joining the alliance? No. To be very clear, uh, we have uh, consistently underscored uh, not only to our Ukrainian partners but uh, to uh, countries around the world that these are sovereign decisions that uh, our Ukrainian partners will need to make for themselves. Uh, what we are here to do is to stand by our Ukrainian partners, to support our Ukrainian partners in any decisions uh, that they would choose to make. Can yes. I just another couple. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, just, we talk so much about sovereign decisions of other countries. What about the sovereignty of the United States in the sense of we obviously have a strong interest in reducing conflict, ending wars, and uh, obviously the longer that this – conflict continues, the greater the risk of escalation and other things like that. Um, it just seems like you guys are so often uh, shifting to the sovereignty of other powers. Uh, the United States has a real stake in this, and why be so reluctant about an outcome that might be in the U.S.'s interest? We're not reluctant about that at all, John. We are doing everything we can. Uh, to see a diminution of the violence, to see an end uh, to this war. You're right that every day this war goes on, there is the uh, chance of escalation. There is the chance of, of broader conflict. But to that end, we've done a couple things. Uh, number one, we've been very clear uh, about uh, steps that we are not going to take. Uh, President Biden has made very clear uh, that American pilots are not going to operate over Ukrainian airspace. Uh, airspace. American service members uh, are not going to operate on uh, Ukrainian soil. Uh, but number two, we have uh, supported our Ukrainian partners in their uh, efforts to achieve a diplomatic resolution uh, to this conflict. Uh, we have supported uh, and we've been in close coordination with our French partners, our German partners, our Israeli partners, our Turkish partners, uh, and others uh, who have engaged directly uh, with Russia diplomatically to see that same outcome achieved. Uh, we share the same overriding objective uh, with all of those allies, with, al with all of those uh, partners. So the idea uh, that we are in any way hesitant uh, to see this conflict come to an end as quickly as it can, uh, that is just not something that rings true. And I think it's also fair uh, that no country uh, has done more to support our Ukrainian partners in an effort uh, to bring this conflict to a close uh, in terms of the diplomacy, in terms of the security assistance, in terms of putting pressure uh, on the Kremlin, on President Putin, on those around him who are responsible uh, for this conflict. And we see all of those lines of effort as complementary. Pressure on the battlefield, pressure on the Russian economy, uh, pressure on the Russian financial system, pressure on oligarchs and senior Russian officials uh, personally, and our efforts to support diplomacy, all of those things uh, do 
uh, support our overriding, overarching goal of seeking to find a diplomatic resolution to this conflict. Ben, or Connor. To follow up on, on your comments on our Fox colleagues, um, in addition to injuring Ben and, and killing Pierre, this attack also killed uh, one of their Ukrainian producers. It's obviously also not the first attack that injured or killed journalists. Do you believe that journalists are being targeted at all in this war? We know, of course, that civilians have been killed. We know, of course, that journalists have been killed. Uh, there was uh, 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 another uh, American journalist uh, who was killed uh, just a couple days ago, uh, Mr. Renault. Uh, we have seen these uh, reports. Uh, what we are doing right now uh, is through every uh, piece of information available to us, uh, we are documenting, we are trying to discern the facts. Uh, if we determine that there is any intentionality here, intentionality in terms of uh, the intentional targeting of civilians or the intentional targeting uh, of journalists uh, or any other group uh, that uh, should be completely off limits under international humanitarian law, under the Geneva Conventions, under uh, the law of armed conflict, uh, that is something that we would take uh, very seriously and there would be a very serious response. Just to follow up on that, so do you guys have like a formal review or an investigation where you're collecting everything and is there like a U.S. government review where there, you're looking into like war crimes? There are a number of re review mechanisms. Uh, we've spoken to uh, the effort that's ongoing with the international, with the uh, ICJ, uh, with the UN Commission of Inquiry, uh, the OSCE has its own process, the ICC has its own process, and yes, uh, here within the State Department we are documenting uh, we are um, uh, compiling uh, all of the information, uh, all of the sources of information uh, that we can uh, to document and to, to form our own conclusion. Right, but I mean, are you going to send them off to these different institutions or are you going to come up with your own determination? Both. Um, we are, what we are, will be the time frame? For we, are that? we are supporting independent investigations. We're doing our own uh, analysis into what uh, has taken place. I wouldn't want to uh, put a time frame on it, but of course, uh, we are as with all things in this conflict, treating it as a matter of urgency. Right. Based on what you've seen so far, is the administration prepared to say that Russia is um, committing war crimes? If we determine that Russia uh, has committed war crimes, we are absolutely uh, determined to uh, make that public. Yes. Okay. I have one on Vienna, unless you have Ukraine. Uh, I have one on Ukraine. Okay. Yeah, go. Okay. Um, I am just wondering about this information, disinformation you guys have been really focused on in Russia. Um, can or should the U.S. government be uh, providing sources of more accurate information to Russians at this time? Well, uh, what I will say is that we have undertaken a concerted effort uh, through means that are available to us to do everything we can to get actual, factual, truthful information into what is a pretty closed Russian information ecosystem. Uh, we have done that through a number of uh, tactics. As you know, a number of us have spoken uh, on Russian TV, uh, independent stations, including some cases, independent stations like Doge, TV Rain, uh, that have been uh, shut down. Uh, also through um, uh, Russian uh, state-backed uh, outlets as well, those that will have on uh, senior American officials. Uh, we uh, use tools like uh, uh, telegram uh, to convey information uh, as well. Every avenue uh, that we can uh, conceive of that would allow us uh, to channel information into Russia to reach Russian audiences, knowing that the best antidote to disinformation uh, is information. That has been our strategy in speaking to audiences uh, here in the United States uh, and around the world. Uh, and it's a challenge when it comes to Russia because President Putin and the Kremlin, they are doing everything they can to further constrict uh, the information space uh, throughout the country. Uh, and so uh, we, too, are trying to get creative uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of our efforts uh, to uh, channel information in. What do you mean you're using Telegram exactly? And um, would the U.S. consider putting any satellite Internet resources um, along the border or things like that? Uh, well, so let me make um, a point about uh, Internet access in Russia. 
Um, we know that the Kremlin is engaged uh, in a full assault, as I said before, on media freedom, access to information, uh, and the truth uh, within Russia. Of course, it wants its version of the facts uh, to be the only version of the facts uh, that is available to the Russian people. Moscow's efforts to mislead, um, uh, they are intensifying. We condemn the Russian government's recent, recent actions to prevent the people of Russia from accessing Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, numerous Russian and international news sites, and certain mobile applications as well. Uh, we also condemn the Russian government's passage of a new law that threatens prison sentences for accurately reporting on Putin's war of choice in Ukraine. Uh, the people of Russia, we've made this point repeatedly, uh, did not choose this war. President Putin did. Those around him did. They have a right, the people of Russia have a right to know about the death, the suffering, the destruction that is being inflicted by their government in their name on the people of Ukraine. The people of Russia also have a right to know about the human costs of this senseless war, uh, including the costs to Russian service members, to their sons, to their brothers, uh, to their husbands. Uh, so for that reason, we support access to the Internet by all people, including uh, the people of Russia. Even as we stand in solidarity with uh, the people of Ukraine, we believe uh, that more information is going to be the answer. Putin believes that less information uh, is what's uh, in his interests. Uh, so, of course, uh, we want to do all we can to support that information flow into Russia to see to it uh, that the Russian people have uh, avenues of communication have a free and open internet uh, available uh, to them. And we call on President Putin and his government to honor Russia's international obligations and commitments uh, to withdraw Russia's troops from Ukraine's territory and to respect uh, the human rights and fundamental freedoms of Russia's citizens. And one of those uh, fundamental freedoms is freedom of access to information. Okay, maybe we can follow up on some more specifics later. But um, just one more quick question on uh, the chemical weapons possibility. Um, we haven't talked about that in a few days, I guess. Um, has the Biden administration determined uh, what their response is going to be if Russia uses chemical weapons? Not that you have to detail it here, but do you guys have um, a response ready to go if Russia does use those weapons in Ukraine? Kylie, the only thing I will say about that is to reiterate what the president said the other day. Uh, if Russia engages in the use of banned agents, including chemical weapons, uh, there will be a severe response from the United States and the international community. Yes. Uh, one more on the Vienna talks. As we were walking in, the Iranian foreign minister said that it was on the U.S. to provide the necessary response for a successful outcome. I mean, from that statement, it seems like you know, they're waiting on the U.S. to, to, to say something either through the EU um, or anybody else to try to get back to Vienna. What I would say uh, is that uh, over the course of the past few weeks, we have made significant progress. Uh, we are close. Uh, there are external factors uh, involved in this now. There are uh, a small number of outstanding issues. The United States, uh, although not a direct party to the talks, we have worked in good faith. Uh, we have uh, sought at every juncture to achieve a mutual return to compliance with the JCPOA, uh, knowing that uh, in our assessment it continues to be uh, the most effective means by which to impose, reimpose a permanent, verifiable limits on Iran's uh, nuclear program. There are a small number uh, of outstanding issues. We do think that we would be in a position to close those gaps, to close that remaining distance, uh, if there are decisions made uh, in capitals, including in Tehran, including in Moscow. Well, one thing that I mean, the top this morning, I mean, the top U.S. military general for the Middle East and the CENTCOM chief uh, quote uh, said wrote on that Iran likely has decreasing tolerance for continued U.S. Presen presence in Syria. Uh, and then he went on, accordingly, Iran and its proxies or affiliates and its affiliates are increasing their capabilities and plan to target U.S. and partner interests. And then he goes on about, you know, more troubling increased proliferation of this advanced technology. Uh, it continues about all these threats and, and things that are concerning. So how do you justify striking a deal that doesn't address any of these um, that you know, impact U.S. national security? Uh, well, what I would say is that we've been very clear that Iran poses a challenge, poses a threat to the United States, to our allies and partners across different realms. Uh, the most significant threat we would face would be 
a nuclear armed Iran. Uh, there would be no greater challenge to the United States, to our allies, to our partners uh, around the world. That is not to say that Iran's nuclear program is the other challenge, is the only challenge we face. Uh, Iran supports uh, regional proxies. It supports terrorist groups. It has uh, a cyber. Uh, it has engaged in malicious uh, cyber activity. It has an active ballistic missile program. Uh, but what we know is that if Iran were in the possession of a nuclear weapon or if it were on the verge of a possession of a nuclear weapon, it could act with far greater impunity. The first thing we want to do is to put Iran's nuclear program back in a box, to take that challenge off the table so that, working with allies and partners, we can confront, we can take on uh, the challenge that Iran poses in these other realms uh, much more effectively. We actually see these goals as quite complementary. Uh, knowing that uh, in a, a nuclear-armed Iran uh, is an Iran that ha would have uh, far greater impunity. And I'll make one other point. Um, our goal is to put the Iranian nuclear program back in a box. It was in a box until 2018. Uh, prior to 2018, when the JCPOA uh, was uh, in full force and full effect, uh, we did not see the same kinds of provocations that we have seen uh, in even in recent days. Uh, so our goal is to put that challenge, take that challenge off the table, uh, and to work with our allies and partners uh, to address uh, the fuller range uh, of threats that uh, we face from Tehran. Oh, last one, sorry, sure. quick. Um, I mean, do you fear that do you fear Russia could be trying to derail these talks in order to prevent, you know, Iranian oil from from coming back on the international market? If presumably, that's you know, what they're going to get under the deal. Well, uh, again, whether or not uh, there is a JCPOA, uh, our posture uh, towards an Iranian oil ban would not change. Uh, we would not replace Russian oil with Iranian oil. Uh, that would not be on the table. Uh, beyond that, uh, you'll have to speak to uh, Moscow. Uh, what I can say is what I've already said, that uh, an Iran that is verifiably permanently barred, prevented from ever obtaining a nuclear weapon, uh, that is equally in our interest as it is in, in Russia's interest. Yes, Glass, quick question. Um, on the previous question on getting information to Russia, uh, who runs the Telegram operation, and do you have an intergovernmental body that is working, coordinating to try to get in this kind of information into Russia? Second question, completely different. General McKenzie told Congress that uh, the U.S. has agreed to U.S. plans to sell F-15s to uh, Egypt. Has the State, State Department formally signed off on that? Uh, we don't speak to uh, potential arms transfers or arms sales until and unless they're notified to Congress. So I just wouldn't have anything to say on that score. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, conveying truthful, accurate message messaging uh, and information uh, into Russia, that's something that we're very focused on as a government. State Department? Or? It's something that the State Department is, is certainly very focused on. It's something that I know a number of our allies and partners uh, are very focused on as well. And we're focused on it because uh, Moscow has sought to be uh, a, uh, a purveyor of information that is false, that is misleading, uh, that is disinformation. I'm sorry, but who in the government is doing this? And is there an interdepartmental inter body that is coordinating this, this kind of activity? Uh, these activities are coordinated across the government. Of course, we work closely with the National Security Council, but a lot of this activity does come out of the State Department uh, in terms of uh, the uh, speaking directly uh, to Russian audiences. If you've been on our uh, social media channels, if you have uh, seen what we've done with uh, Russian uh, media, independent media, uh, media that is closer to the Russian state, uh, much of that is emanating from uh, the State Department. Uh, of course, our embassy in Moscow is very engaged in this as well, but I'll also make the point uh, that our allies and partners uh, around the world have been doing the same because the disinformation that we have seen emanate from Moscow targets not only the United States and mischaracterizes not only what we have done, but also uh, what our allies and partners around the world are doing. So it is a shared objective uh, of the United States, of our allies and partners, to fight this disinformation, this misinformation, uh, with information, with facts, with truth, uh, for people here in this country, for people around the world, including people in Russia. Thank you all very much. I do not have any travel updates at this time.